thank you all for coming. As mentioned, my name is Scott Cowan. I am a corporate emerging growth partner in the Short Hills, New Jersey office of DLA Piper. Can I just say that it's really wonderful to actually see all of you and be here. And this is actually my first in-person event in the last 18 months, so it's, it's, it's exciting. Um, on behalf of DLA Piper's Emerging Growth and Venture Capital Lawyers, I welcome those of you in person and virtually as well. Uh, we at DLA are proud to be a returning sponsor of what is now one of the, the best must-attend events for innovation. Uh, so without further ado, and given that we only have 30 minutes, I'm going to dive right into the substance. Uh, first, I'd like each of the panelists to provide brief, very brief introductions and background on themselves, including kind of what sectors you play in. Good after. Oh, Jesus, that's really loud. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Scott. Thanks to um, to Aaron and Anna and the Propellify team. This is this is great um, to be here. Also, my first event um, back, so that's really great. Um, I'm Tim Rollander, I'm the director of venture programs at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Um, the EDA is an independent state agency built to create high quality jobs, catalyze investment, and foster inclusive development in the state of New Jersey. Um, we look at all, we're built to support companies of all stages and all sectors to help them grow in the state of New Jersey. Great. Hi, uh, Bobby Dickey. I'm with Edison Partners, also my first in-person event, so uh, very excited to be here. Um, our firm is based in Princeton, New Jersey. We're a growth equity fund, currently investing out of our 10th fund. Um, we focus across three core verticals, fintech, healthcare IT, and enterprise. Um, my name is Mark Kolb. I'm a partner with Tech Council Ventures. Uh, we're a New Jersey-based uh, early-stage investor, uh, pretty technology agnostic. Thank you, panelists. So we're just going to jump right into it. We titled this panel, How to Build and Fund a Business. Um, what do we want each of you to get out of this? Ideally, you all leave today with a better understanding of the marketplace and what you should do and not do to ensure greater success for the growth of your company and more importantly, what you can do to improve your chances of having a successful fundraising event. To that, that end, please do not hesitate to raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, we want to make sure all your questions are being answered. We're going to structure this panel a little differently. Um, given we only have 30 minutes, we're going to ask each of the panelists a number of rapid fire type questions, probably somewhere between three to four questions. And each of them is going to provide very quick one sentence or less answers. Then after concluding each of those questions, we're going to poll all of you. And you guys are going to tell us which questions you want them to focus on. So if there's four questions, you're going to raise your hand. I like question two more than question three. And then they'll do the typical provide a couple minute response on each of those questions. That way it allows you know, them to respond to what you care about and what you're actually interested in learning. So with that said, let's just start. Investors are typically searching, this is question one. Uh, investors are typically searching for a business opportunity. The entrepreneur's plan is to convince the investor that the entrepreneur has what it takes to turn an idea into a breathing, viable enterprise. Based on your experiences, what do you typically look for and find in a business plan and pitch meeting that when looking back on things, turned out to be indicators of a successful business? Why don't we start with you, Mark? Okay, short answers. I'd say a CEO or a leadership team that truly understands the market, the market that they're selling into. I agree, Dom domain expertise and understanding the, the market dynamics. Um, I'll go a little different, I'll just say traction, a company that has some commercial success to some point uh, by the time they walk into the office. Question two, what do you typically look for and find in an entrepreneur that often turns out to be an indicator of a successful business. We'll start with you again, Mark. Um, I'm going to tell you what my partner, Jim Gunton, says. Jim Gunton looks for an entrepreneur that has a chip on their shoulder. And, that, and what he means by that is someone that is so hungry for success that they're just going to kill themselves to be successful. And you can see that in a, in a guy or a gal. Yeah. For, uh, in talking to an entrepreneur, we look for coachability and the ability to take feedback. We want to see somebody who has already seen the challenges and that they're able to pivot, that they're able to adjust and still try and achieve their mission and their vision no matter the roadblocks they come. Question three, 
What are some of the lessons that you could tell a founder as to how to scale a business? And one lesson would be fine here. Customers first. Rely on your team. Uh, product market fit. Question four, and the last one in the first segment. How actively are you involved with the portfolio company? What value add do you bring to the table? How often and when should a company be reaching out to you, its investors, when they need help? Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, EDA is really positioned to be a resource for businesses in the state. Think of us first. Um, you know, not only are we a source of dollars for businesses, but also if we can introduce you to an accountant or an attorney or an investor, um, you know, we're happy to do that. That's the fun part of the job. Yeah, so as minority investors, we operate more on the pull model than push. So the uh, CEO or management team needs to pull us in saying, hey, I need help here, raising their hand. Um, we're not pushing our playbooks or agendas onto them, uh, nor can we, given our, our minority investment. Yeah, sticking with short answers, it's, it's when the CEO or the team needs some help. We, we want to be there, and we will engage as much as necessary. Great. So now I'm going to poll all of you. Those were very quick responses. Normally they provide a couple minutes on each, and I know they're more than happy to do that. So I'm going to take a quick poll, questions one through four. Who wants to hear them more detailed rationale and responses on question one? Please raise your hand. Question two. Question three. Question four. I think it was three. It's close. It's close, but it's question three. So what are some of the lessons that you could tell a founder as to how to scale a business? Any one of you could take I can, that. I can start. Um, so yeah, as a founder, what we see, you have a, a lot of people uh, chirping in your ear, a lot of stakeholders saying you should build this product, uh, you know, inc include this feature, target this customer base. Um, but really, the, the stakeholder that matters most is your customer. Um, and I think that's true whether you're a two-person startup or, or a large public company. Um, prior to Edison, I was at um, Constant Contact, which is an email, uh, uh, email marketing software company up in Boston. Um, public company at the time, 350 million revenue, billion dollar market cap, and you know, we had three guiding principles. I don't, I don't remember the, the last two, but the first one was, was customer first. So it really does translate up and down sort of the spectrum of, of, of company size. So uh, I've, I've said product market fit a couple of times, and, and, and I said focus on really understanding your, your customer, and I think we agree there. Um, once, once you've got that, and once you've got some semblance of an offering and a, and a market that, that, that work and that fit, then scaling is about execution. And execution to me is about, it's about building the right plans, it's about hiring the right team, it's about putting the right goals and planning. But it's, it's a planning thing. It, it, the expression, um, hope is not a strategy, right? So it, it's, once you've got the basics, it, it's, it's hard work and it's execution. Probably the most important would be the team. I'll pick right up on that. It's, it's team, honestly. At the end of the day, can anybody do everything? No. Um, a lot of founders try and you know, pursue the fundraising path and try and you know, force down the road a little bit faster than they should. Um, at the end of the day, dollars aren't necessarily the, necessarily the solution. It's, you know, it's build the right team around you. Build your people that have the expertise in marketing and sales and HR. Um, and as a founder, you know, you're going to have to wear a lot of hats, but you've got to trust the people around you. Thank you. Let's go to segment two. Again, rapid fire, quick answers, guys. Uh, what do investors want in a CEO? Any absolute no-nos for founders? Things that you just don't want to see. First Who's word, ever ready? <laughs> coach, coachability. Someone that, that's willing to learn, willing to listen, willing to take advice. And if they're, they're younger and, and not as experienced, someone that really can be coached. Agree with that. Um, also, someone who can attract good talent. Uh, I mean, you can have a great CEO, but you're, you're only one man you need, or, or woman. Um, you, you need the leverage. Um. Don't be stopped by roadblocks. Um, you're going to see a lot of roadblocks on the path. Um, it's the ability to really push through, achieve that, that, that same vision that you had um, by trying to overcome any of those roadblocks. So just don't stop. Question two. 
Investors are always searching for a business opportunity. The founder's plan must be to convince the investor that the founder has what it takes to turn an idea into a breathing viable enterprise. How do you go about valuing a company? What do you consider? Keeping in mind, quick answers. Um, for us, it's a little easier. EDA follows on investment, so it's a little bit of a cop out in this case, but we look to see what everybody else is doing. <laughs> uh, given our stage, we focus on companies. Um, we're sort of at the, the other end of the speculative, speculative end of venture, so companies that have product market fit is dictated by um, traction in revenue, and so looking at revenue between 10 and $30 million. So as far as how do you value, it's a bit of an art. There's certainly some science and there's a lot of metrics to it, but it's a bit of an art, uh, I'd say. I think what you have to remember is that it's not all about valuation. Founders focus and worry about valuation, but they've also got to worry about terms and conditions because the two go hand in hand. That's a good point. Question three, shifting to the operations and strategic side. What are the chances an investment in my company will be successful? What measures can I take as a founder to ensure I make the most of the investment and grow the business? Um, so there's obviously a lot of money out there. You know, uh, do some self-reflection on yourself and your team to understand what you got, what you're missing, and then uh, go find the investor that can provide that and fill that hole. You know, when you take money, the key is that money is specifically for growth. You're not looking for it to pay debt or something else. And I think the CEO's job is to figure out, as he's building his budget, it's about, is this plan, is each dollar I'm spending going to be something that's going to help us grow this business? Whether it's a marketing money or sales money or product dev money. Most businesses fail. 90% um, of businesses fail, but it's the ones that are able to, to again, think through, okay, how do I manage the resources that I have here so that we can make it to the next quarter, to the next sale, to the next iteration? And question four, what are the most common mistakes by entrepreneurs in pitches or in the early stages of a business? Many folks say that if you can't tell the story in a couple of sentences, it's a problem. You need some type of story. From your experiences, what mistakes are entrepreneurs making that often stunt the growth of the business? You know, I'd say um, you've really got to read your audience when you're speaking. You've got to be thinking out, do they understand me? Do they, do, are they, not are they listening, but do they understand what I'm saying? And it's so easy to give a pitch and not do that. So I think the mistake is in not paying attention to the signs of your audience and figuring out how to adapt. I think, I think part of the answer is kind of in the question, and that is you need to focus. Um, scope creep is a real thing, and people try to be all things to all people, and you, you, you can't do that. I have both those answers, so I'll just go with Mark's because it was first. Um, you've, got, you've got to be able to, to, to read your audience, figure out, okay, what are they talking about here? Some of the smartest people in the world are not the people that can understand absolutely everything. It's the people that can convey to absolutely anyone what's going on. Communicator. All right, so those are the end of the second segment of four questions. If you remember what they are, <laughs> if you could raise your hand if you'd like to hear more about question one, raise your hand. Question two, question three, and question four. Overwhelmingly question four. So just as a reminder, what are the common mistakes that we have some entrepreneurs out there, common mistakes that entrepreneurs make in pitches or early stages of a business? Uh, from your experiences, what mistakes are they making that often stunt the growth of the business? Yeah, so uh, my answer was was lack of focus and, and kind of scope creep in general. Um, you know, as I said earlier, being an entrepreneur, um, while it is lonely, uh, there's just a lot of people chirping in your ear, telling you to do this, telling you to do that, whether it's your management team members, whether it's your board members, whether it's your customers, whether it's your product guys, um, but you know, having conviction about what you're building and the product that you're building and sort of staying in your swim lane. Um, and I guess, you know, spreading out to adjacencies is fine, but um, you know, do it methodically. Get, get the current focus, wh whether it's a vertical, whether it's a product line, whether it's a customer base, get that repeatable, get that predictable, get that profitable, uh, and then you can move on to the next. 
Um, I think I said basically focus on who your audience is and understand what's their need. I mean, certain salespeople go out there and they try and, you know, they take their shiny product and they'll try and sell it to everybody. You're going to have a much higher probability of success if you figure out, okay, who is my audience here? Who am I talking to? Um, and then make sure that that person is the one seeing your product, basically. I mean, that's going to double your chances of success in that case. So, Scott, you're, you're, but you're asking about the pitch itself? Up to you. You take it in any direction you want. But it could be the, the pitch. It could also just be what mistakes they're making that hurt the business from growing. Okay, well, let, let's, uh, uh, let's look at the, it from the pitch standpoint sure. when you're originally doing that. Uh, because you, you, there's lots of examples. You can go online to, to find examples of what pitch deck should look like and so on. Um, I find that they usually are way too long and that, and that uh, there's a lot, when, when we're listening to a pitch deck, 12 or 15 pages is all we need, and, and we pretty quickly can understand the problem. We're gonna decide whether we believe you, what you're putting down there on the, on the size of the market. We wanna dwell on, we wanna understand and hear the team, we wanna hear about the offering and how it really matches for what that market needs. We wanna see a financial plan, and we wanna see it be believable, but people, don't even hit all the right elements, and then they make it too long and so on. I think a pitch deck can be 12, 15 pages. I completely agree. I think people often find that because they think their business may be complicated, it means they need to add more slides to explain it. It's actually quite the opposite. <laughs> Shorter is uh, much cleaner. All right, so given the time here, we're gonna switch to going from building a business to funding a business. So question one in funding a business. With fairly cheap and plentiful money around, affordable technology constantly reducing entry barriers, are we heading for a new technology dot com bub type bubble? Or are the technology and life sciences spaces fairly valued? What is your view basically of the current market? Um, I'll be the, the New Jersey guy on this one. Um, new Jersey is at a really interesting point. Um, we've seen in the state a 240% capital increase to uh, from the venture capital space since 2018. Um, we have seen faster growth in this state since more so than any of the seven surrounding states. Um, so there's a lot of money here right now. Keep mine a little shorter. Uh, yes, I think we are in a bubble, and yes, I think companies are overvalued. Agreed. <laughs> Question two. From an investor's perspective, what makes financing one particular company more attractive than investing in a different company? Well, if everything else is equal in terms of the opportunity and the financial and so on, what's important is the CEO and, and, and your ability to work with that person. Remember, you're going you're gonna to live with them for the next five or seven years. It might, might as well be someone that you, that, you, that you like, that you respect, and you think you can work well with. Yep, totally agree. Um, when we look at a business, we look at the, the three M's, market, management, and model. And if you're focused on a, a payments business or you know, marketing automation business, you know, the market and the model is generally pretty much the same. The one variable, uh, as was refer referred to, is, is the team management. Um, I'll reflect on old world wisdom that one of my former bosses gave me. Um, no investment is a great investment at every price, but any investment is a good investment at some price. So it comes down to valuation in some case. Question three. In, in my opinion, investors often shy away from directly answering the questions pertaining to at what point a company is fundable, or they give a very generic answer regarding revenue or something. I believe it's easy to tell an entrepreneur that they are fundable when they are making money, but I always wish with their experience and expertise investors would give more direct insights into what can be done to improve a venture's chances. From all your experiences on the panel, when in a company's life cycle, in your opinion, is a company fundable? Um, well, I kind of want to answer your question indirectly because uh, there's a caveat there. Um, but directly answering, I think identifying a large enough market opportunity and uh, getting, some, getting pr product market fit um, when, so I said earlier, when there's some marker of traction, um, and the easy answer is, okay, when there's revenue, um, 
think of what can be a demonstrable form of traction to your investors. Is it dollars raised? Is it customers on board? Is it, is it revenue at some point? But when there's, there's demonstrable traction. Scott, it's an unfair question. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you why. Um, if you look at the three of us, we all invest at different levels. A company that's fundable to me, that's got a million dollars in revenue, is not going to be fundable for this guy because he wants it to be higher in revenue and, and different for them. That, that's so, why I asked the question. And, and, and what? what <laughs> that, that was my caveat too. So, but, but the, the learning here is that when you're raising money, you've got to be very thoughtful about whose door you're going to knock on. Don't go knock on a door of someone that's inappropriate for you. Don't go knock on Bessemer's door when you should be knocking on our door, or Edison's door when you should be knocking on a different one. That's a great point. Question four and the last question in this segment. Any particular key metrics or criteria that you look for when determining whether a company is fundable? Are there certain criteria that you pay particularly more attention to when analyzing a company's funding prospects that is in any one particular sector as opposed to a company in a different sector? Well, Scott, it's another unfair question. <laughs> well, if, if I'm looking at a life science company and they've got four years before they even apply to the FDA, that's a lot different and, and, I, and I, I've got to count on having that much time as opposed to if it's an enterprise software company that's, that's got some pipeline and ready to start closing deal, they're, they're going to be much earlier. So again, it, it, it's all different. I, I agree. I think um, maybe not differing from sector to sector, but B2C and B2B, um, capital efficiency is a, a specific metric that we would key off of. Um, we're a much simpler animal. Um, I'll tell you, if a company comes in and says, okay, I want an investment, um, I would like a $250,000 NJ Covest note, which is our low cost convertible note. I want to see that you have three referenceable customers, right? That's the bar. If you're a company of a different stage, I want to see you've got $500,000 in revenue before you come in for an Edison loan. No coincidence. That's all right. <laughs> um, all right, it's poll time. Question one, please raise your hands. Question two. Question three, and question four. Hands down, question three. When in a company's life cycle, in your opinion, is a company fundable? I don't, think, I don't think we're surprised by this. I said I'm very <laughs> impressed people could remember all those questions. Did you just raise your hand randomly and say, that's the hardest question? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of the, the same answer, I think. Um, you know, identifying, at least to make a business investable, you know, finding a big enough market where an investor can make a return, while at the same time showing, um, you know, that there is product market fit, so there's appetite in the market, there's unmet need, um, and then taking that, those sort of customer behaviors and patterns and extrapolating them out into the future and seeing if, like, is it, can this business be big enough for us to make a return? Okay, so we, we heard that, and this is a fair question. Okay. We, we heard that um, it's different in, it, in each industry. Again, if it's an FDA regulated deal versus an enterprise software. But then, if it's similar in the industry, and so I think you then want to go back and look at the team and, and say, do we trust these people? Do we think these are people that can really be successful? A lot of early stage businesses end up being successful in something that was not their original idea. Lots of companies pivot. And the best teams around are the ones that can take an idea, and if they're not being successful with it, they pivot left, they pivot right, and they find the right idea. So maybe they're fundable when you, when you, when you start to trust that this is the team that can, can get where they need to get. Um, EDA runs an event called NJ Founders and Funders. It's set up like an investor speed dating event. Um, We've been running it since 2014. We'll have a combination of angels and VC investors, and they are put in one-on-one -on -one conversations with companies that are in their similar industry. And so when you're kind of a fly on the wall listening to these companies interact with these investors, it really, the bar, bar none for us is really looking for a company that has that, again, demonstrable traction. Is it revenue? Is it... Um, if you're in a life science space, what, what, what kind of dollars have you raised? What phase are you in in terms of development? 
Um, so think through your industry, think through what are the demonstrable forms of traction you can demonstrate to an investor. All right, only a few minutes left, so let's just get to some more rapid fire questions. Is there anything you are noticing in the current market that is unique to a particular sector that you are not personally experiencing or seeing in a se different sector? Uh, for us, given our focus, we're you know, B2B SaaS, FinTech. Uh, I mean, it's, it's all very active, um, so no. Uh, no. Fair answer. A <laughs> lot of deals out there, a yeah. lot, lot of good deals. Okay. Number one indicator of success for an early stage company. And there's been a theme throughout the entire day, so I'm sure I can almost tell you what the three answers are gonna be right here, but. Uh, traction. Uh, ROI for the customer. Sorry to be repetitive, but a team that, that understands their market. Anything unique from a process perspective when dealing with a company in one sector versus another? In other words, does an investment in one particular sector take longer than an investment in a different sector for each of your you know, funds, essentially? Uh, yeah, I mean, from our perspective, EDA will, again, we're built to support companies of all stages and sectors. Um, a lot of times for us, we can draw a parallel to the industry into which a company is selling. Um, a company that's typically in the ed tech sector, they'll have a longer sales cycle and that can translate into a longer funding cycle. Um, likewise, a company in the life science sector is looking for typically greater dollars. And of course, that can, that can take a little bit longer. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty basic thought process there. Yeah, I mean, I think the, a lot of the hard work is, is done up front, is understanding the market, the players, what are the dynamics, and if you don't know that before you're investing and doing diligence, then you probably shouldn't be doing the, the deal in the first place. Um, but I get to, to get specific, um, maybe not sector to sector differences, but um, related to B2B and B2C, in the diligence process, there, there definitely are some, um, some differences in the process and how you go about things. Yeah, when I, when I introduced our fund, I said we're technology agnostic, but there's several areas we focus in, healthcare being one of them, and that's one that happens to be my background. So because of that, it's pretty, pretty easy for me to get into deals pretty quickly. My partner, Steve, enterprise, and so on. So I think if you're, if you're working with an investor who knows the space, and that's one that they focus on, I think it can be a pretty, uh, a pretty straightforward process. I'm just curious, and this is probably the last question. I've been wanting to get your thoughts on this. With all these crazy high valuations and capital everywhere for the most part, I've personally been seeing founders take money off the table, which historically is quite rare um, in a, you know, early stage financing. I'm curious, how do you feel about founders taking some money off the table in a financing prior to an exit? I'm, to I'm totally good with it. I mean, it's got to be in perspective and so on, but, uh, but, but as long as it's not out of whack on the number, it's fine. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The, the two situations where we see founders taking secondary is if there is a founder who's no longer the CEO, he's brought in a hired gun and um, may or may not be active in the business, and so it's a chance for him to liquidate his position. Um, and then secondly, if a management team has been sort of going at something for a while, um, and all a lot, if not all of their wealth is tied up into it and they want to liquidate a portion, but if they're coming in and saying, hey, we're gonna sell 90%, you know, that's probably a red flag. Um. I echo exactly. We want to see a founder have skin in the game, but absolutely uh, uh, echo the comments of my colleagues. Thank you. I think our time is up. I want to thank each of the panelists. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the different format. And thank you for coming.